the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Feliz Dia de la Madre a todas las madres. Again, Happy Mother's Day to all mothers. And Feliz Dia de la Madre a todas las madres. And I hope that um, it's a wonderful day for all mothers and that uh, their families, uh, their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren um, make it a very special day for, for mom and for grandma, for great-grandma. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> You know, we're continuing to read. I'm going to make a comment on the scriptures, and they may be topics that are a little bit disconnected, but we'll try to pull them together at the end here. Um, we have this reading from the sixth chapter of, of the Acts of the Apostles, and it's here that we hear about the appointment of deacons. So in a sense, it's a, a deacon's day today, our deacon. We have a deacon. These are the first deacons that we hear about that are appointed they say to serve at table, um, and they selected seven reputable men filled with the wisdom and the spirit of God. They point them to a task. Um, and the apostles, I guess, they were busying themselves with caring for those in need, physical need, etc. And uh, they needed to devote themselves more to the preaching of the gospel. And so they appointed seven men. And the primary role of the deacon, even though we see deacons, uh, they can proclaim the word of God, you know, they can read the gospel, they can preach, they help out with certain of the sacraments, and it's one of the orders of holy orders. Um, but the principal task is to truly be concerned about and caring for those in need. And uh, in our parish, in our deacon, uh, he even has, a, has, a, uh, he has that ministry and he exercises it very, very well. And, uh, of course, we want to say thank you to Deacon Jock for your wonderful service, etc. Both uh, sacramental and for the poor. But I'd, I, want to, I want to point out something in the, in the beginning of this reading where it says, the number of disciples continued to grow. So we're seeing the growth of the Christian community. And then it says, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, I'm sure, of food and of clothing or whatever was needed. Now, the Hellenists were the non-Jewish Christians. And, of course, the Hebrews are the Jewish Christians. Of course, all the apostles were Hebrews, right? So there were non-Jewish converts to Christianity, and there were the Jewish Christians who had converted to Christianity. And of course, this is, you can see, even within the Christian community, um, I don't want to say a racial prejudice, but you know where you have different groups of people in opposition to each other. And it was recognized by the apostles immediately. And they uh, took fairly drastic action. Okay, they selected men to attend to the needs of those who were not being attended to. And I imagine they gave a good talking to the Hebrew Christians about uh, acting as though, you know, we're just the ones that are important, the other people are not. Okay? And it's a good lesson for us all to learn. You know, we hear an awful lot about racism these days. And unfortunately, it's, pro it's almost become s s nonsensical because you hear political leaders and others that want to, uh, I don't know, bang a drum. They keep call, calling about racism, racism, or conflicts between ethnicities and this and that, almost as though they're trying to create uh, conflict. Well, that's not what Christians do, even from the very beginning. If there is a problem, what we do is we correct the problem, okay? We don't use it as an excuse for even bad behavior or for the pressing of things that we know are contrary to the way God calls us to live. 
And we see that in our time. And I'm sure many people think, oh, this is good because I'm calling it racist. Or this person is xenophobic. That's not what we do. What we do, if there is conflict between peoples, if it has to do with language or ethnicity or race, as it were, we, be, we embrace everybody and remind everybody that we're one family in Christ, in the Christian community, and that humanity is one family, all having been created by God. The differences bring a great beauty to humanity, differences of, of, of race, differences of language, differences of culture. This brings a beautiful, beautiful garden of, of many colored flowers to humanity. But each one, each one in the eyes of God is of equal dignity. And everyone is called to be part of the family of God, of the church. That's our perspective. Every person is made in the image and likeness of God and is called to be part of God's family, the uh, object and the subject of God's love by the power of the Holy Spirit and baptism. That's not often pointed out in this reading, I'm sure, but uh, given the, the tenor of our times, I think it should be pointed out, is that even in the first Christian community, there were groups that felt like, well, we're the ones that deserve everything, first of all, and we are ignoring the others. And what the apostles did is that, I'm sure they gave them a good talking to, and then, then they actually took action to make sure that those who were being neglected because of racial differences, uh, we're taken care of and we're included in equal dignity with everyone else. That's what we do as Christians. In the Gospel of John today, I mean, the reading from St. Peter is absolutely beautiful and could have an entire homily unto its own. But in John today, we have this reading where the Lord says, um, he says this phrase, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'll repeat that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. There's really only been one time in almost what is it, 39 years of, of priesthood, 40 years of preaching, uh, that um, I've had somebody stand up in the congregation while I was preaching and yell at me. Now, I've heard that this, that happens quite often these days um, because of the culture that we live in and the incredible neglect of the leaders of the church to give pop, proper direction and teaching to the people of God. So there's been, a, and plus all of the scandals, there's been a tremendous loss of, uh, of respect and, uh, um, and moral authority on the part of the church as such. It's been uh, not merely whittled down, it's been chopped down, as it were. And to a great extent, uh, a lot of the fault lays on the leaders of the church. I won't go into all that right now. But I myself, I'm sure people have gotten up and walked out sometimes. And, uh, uh, and one thing I do notice also is be, uh, the way that people speak to a priest. Uh, Cat I'm talking Catholic people. is very different than when I was a child. Very different than when I was a child. Uh, and that has to do with the loss of faith. And it ultimately go comes back to the leadership of the church because we have not passed the faith on to the people so that the general culture will tell them, well, believe whatever you want to believe. Go where you feel good. Um, you know, there's a great praise band over here, and we all get worked up emotionally, and we put our hands in the air, and, and this, that, and the other thing. Or just look inside yourself and find your own God, this sort of thing. Hmm? Well, a lot of that, I think we're, that we priests are going to have to answer for a lot of that because of the neglect of, of actually preach, preaching and standing with the gospel the true gospel. But I was preaching this passage, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I went on to say when I was preaching, I said, what that means is, 
is that anybody who has any connection to God at all, to the divine, either by the order of creation or by the order of grace, that is personal, lovely relationship with God, our participation in divine life, either way, creation or grace, is that is in Jesus Christ, period. Nobody has any connection to God at all, either as God being creator and sustainer of everything that exists, or by the personal relationship of love and grace with Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only in Jesus Christ. There is no other way home to God the Father, period. And what I mean by that is that anyone, even if they do not have the explicit Christian faith, who is connected with God, it's in Jesus Christ, whether they're aware of it or not. Which means, if the Buddha is in heaven, he's there because of Jesus. If Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce tribe is in heaven, he's there because of Jesus. Anyone who has a connection with God, and they could have a personal connection of love, it's in Christ Jesus, whether they're aware of it or not, and they are called to come to be fully members of God's family and become part of the church. That's why the gospel needs to be preached. We need to evangelize, proselytize. I know some of the leadership of the church says, well, you shouldn't proselytize. Yeah, you should proselytize. You should tell people about Jesus. It's an act of love. At any rate, this lady stood up when I was preaching in a cathedral in Santa Rosa, California, where I was stationed, and uh, she starts yelling at me, you closed-minded bigot, etc., etc., etc. And so I let her continue on, and then she sat down, I finished my homily. And I saw her after Mass, and she came up to me, and I said, ma'am, if you don't believe that, then you're not a Christian. That's the basic Christian faith. Jesus is God's given son to us to re restore and reconcile us to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. There is no other way to God. That's why it is so important that we let people know about Jesus. Not to condemn them, to say, oh, you're so wrong, etc., but to invite them to come to the Lord so that they will come to a fuller relationship with Almighty God, a personal relationship and a participation in divine life, and have all the means of learning and sanctification that are available to them by means of God's family, the church. Now, ideally, when someone does become a Catholic and is fully a part of the Church of God, the whole Church of God, not just pieces that we find where people have various understandings of Jesus and of the sacraments or this, that, the other thing. No, what's been passed on from the apostles, the community that's connected with the apostolic community, the Catholic Church, the universal church, that contains within itself all the means of salvation given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this should be reflected in families. And since it's Mother's Day, I'm going to do something that I... I periodically do on Mother's Day, but I don't think I've done it for a couple years at least here in St. Rita's. I think last Mother's Day I wasn't even here. I think I was preaching back east somewhere. But my grandmother, Elizabeth Zinni Cassis, or Cassis, a little Lebanese lady, uh, when she died, I did her funeral, 
she died back in 1983, quite some time ago. Um, she left a will, a testament. And it was not for the distribution of physical and material goods, but it was what she wanted the family to know and remember always. And uh, on my dad's side of the family, we have a very, very large family. I have 45 first cousins. I think it's 45 first cousins on my dad's side of the family. And now there are literally hundreds and hundreds of us, and there's a big family uh, get together around Christmas time every year, which I haven't been to for years, which I'm going to try to go to this year, and uh, in Sacramento, California. But my grandma died, and they found this will of hers, and it was just it was written in her hand, kind of just scratched out in her. She wasn't illiterate, but she wasn't, you know, learned. I don't know if you can see this, uh, kind of the. Uh, kind of scratched out in her hand. She could write and everything. But uh, she and her family came from the mountains in Lebanon like my grandfather did. And I would encourage uh, mothers to uh, listen well to this letter. Listen well to this, this letter here. It says, uh, there's a cross at the top of the page and uh, this is what she says. Dear family, this world is not ours. We are just passing through. Eternity is ours. Teach your children about God, his mother, St. Joseph, and the saints. St. Joseph was a good and pious man. He loved Jesus and Mary and died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Blessed Mary, our mother, when she died, was carried to heaven by the angels. She was a virgin and died a virgin, had no other children. Jesus was her only child, also St. Joseph's only child. Teach the family to pray. Go to Holy Communion and confession, mass often. Pray to your guardian angel and patron saint. You have one, ask them to guard you. Do not pay attention to those complaining about mass changes. We must accept the changes. There is a reason we do not understand. Read your Bible, have a Bible, a Catholic Bible in your home, a cross and, a holy, pic and holy pictures. Hang a picture up. There are disappointments in this life. We must accept what God gives us. Do not neglect your children in their faith, or they will neglect their children. Be kind and understanding to them. They need you. Follow God's rules. They are good. Keep away from troubles, drugs, alcohol, and anything that will injure. That will injure your health and soul. Your bodies are the temple of God. Take care of it. Simple, simple lady. Keep your Catholic faith. It is the true faith which has, which has been in our family for many, many, many generations. Pray the rosary often. Do not neglect it. Implore Mary's protection for yourselves and your dear ones. Our Lady appeared to St. Dominic, St. Simon, and Lucia. She gave them the rosary and taught them how to use it. Many miracles were performed by praying the rosary. You should wear the brown scapular. Keep in your heart by repeating over and over, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I love you. Protect us. Save souls. Help each other if necessary. Be one big family. You are. Stay that way. Follow the Ten Commandments. You will have peace of mind. Pray for yourselves, family, relatives, and those who are forgotten. Pray for your dad and I and grandparents. Offer masses. It is getting late, so I must say good night, dear ones. 
my blessing to all my good son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, all my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I pray someday we will all be united together in our heavenly home. Bless you all, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, Elizabeth Veronica Cassis. Mothers, hang on to that simple, solid faith. Give it to your children. And, um, and we all will be one in our heavenly home someday. And parents, um, Jesus is the only way home to God the Father. You know it. Live it. And give it to your children. Laudator Jesus Christus. May Jesus Christ be praised. Please stand.